Victor, and your distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm very honored to be part of the Fung Global Institute and delighted to participate in its inaugural Asian Global Dialogue. Andrew has invited me to talk about how I did my job as chairman of China's banking regulator and how China will be able to achieve the objectives set out in its 12th five-year plan. If you will bear with me, I will address the second topic first because, to be honest, I find it easier to talk about the 12th five-year plan than banking reform, a topic, <laughs> a topic in which I was so personally involved. In March last year, China National People's Congress approved the 12th five-year plan for the period from 2011 to 2015 with the three, three key objectives. The first is to promote the inclusive growth and reduce the social inequality. The second is to rebalance our economy. The third is to protect the environment. In other words, China wishes to build a middle income economy that is in harmony with society, nature, and the rest of the world. These objectives you have achieved will clearly bring huge opportunities to everyone here. As people in this room understand, though, the targets are not easy to achieve. Chinese leaders also appreciate how difficult the challenges are. China's economic reforms have lifted millions out of poverty and turned its economy into the second largest the world over within three decades. However, most Chinese are only too aware that, in Premier Wen Jiabao's words, China's economic growth is unsteady, unbalanced, uncoordinated, and unsustainable. I guess in best Chinese tradition, we can label them the four ends. <laughs> can anyone here ima imagine what the consequences would be of a collapsing Chinese economy now, especially when the news from European, Europe remains so worrying and the recovery in the US remains fragile. To me, the greatest contribution China can make as a responsible global stakeholder in building a new global economic and the social order is to keep its own house in order, namely to make its own economy more steady, more balanced, more coordinated, and more sustainable. We can call this the four mores. Can China reach the ambitious targets it has set for itself in the 12 five-year plan? And if so, how? Let us examine this important question by taking as an example environment protection, one of the three pranks of the current five-year plan. Climate change linked to greenhouse gas emissions is an increasingly high profile public concern in China, along with the mountain health issues linked to the pollution. The government is committed to reduce its carbon emissions per unit of capital by 17% over the next five years. By year 2020, China will bring down its energy intensity measured by energy consumption per unit of GDP by 40 to 50 percent from year 2005 level. And China is determined to reduce its water and air pollutants and harmful particulates by reducing levels of both chemical oxygen demand and SO2 by 8 percent and NLX by 10 percent over the next five years. Moreover, 
China's new green economy strategy also calls for an increase in forest coverage from 20% now to 21.7% over the next five years. Once again, we must ask if China can achieve such targets. In my view, the answer is yes, so long as we do our homework and know how to focus our attention and efforts. One imperative is to design and build energy efficient residential housing and office buildings. Another is to develop energy efficient modern industries. From year 2006 to 2010, China ranked number one in the world in terms of new housing construction, which has increased by 7.4 billion square meters. I expect that trend will continue for the next five years because China's population currently standing at 1.3 billion will peak at 1.6 billion by 2020. By then, more than 130 million people will have moved from rural to urban areas. That is greater than the entire population of Japan. A further 100 million urban residents will need better housing. If all new residential housing and the public buildings can be built with proper insulation materials, then and they will be air conditioned by green technologies. We witnessed a lot of them the world over. You can imagine how much it will reduce China's carbon footprint and energy intensity. This is the case, not even counting the rapid progress being already made with clean coal, shale gas, and the renewable energy, the solar and uh, wind power in particular. Similarly, China has huge possibilities for improving the energy efficiency of its rapid growing industries. Large and medium sized industrial enterprises currently account for up to 40% of GDP. This is, of course, too high. By boosting the services component of the economy, China can also reduce its energy consumption. Moreover, China can leapfrog the next stage of its industrialization if industry operating standards and the prices for energy and the resources can be soon rationalized through regulatory and the market incentives. We would soon see the emergence of a greener, more sustainable economy. To me, this would be an achievement as impressive and visible as building the Great Wall. By leveraging a full spectrum of public and the private resources, China can also work with other Asian countries on the creation, commercialization, and the spread of green technology in the region and beyond. I believe that together, we could even exceed the sustainability targets of the 12 five-year plan. Let me now turn to some personal recollections on the reform of China banking industry. When I was appointed the first chairman of the China Banking Regulatory Commission, or CBRC we call it, in year 2003, I took a close look at all kinds of regulatory data and the market data and the information. What I saw was quite terrifying. Some of you might remember the estimations about China's non-performing loans 
by outsiders, which ranged from 25% to 60%. I felt like the captain of Titanic. <laughs> Only unlike Captain Edward Smith 100 years ago, I did see the iceberg dead ahead. <laughs> I had to alter course dramatically and immediately, or we were doomed. I briefed Premier Wen on my plan to turn around China's entire banking sector. I assured him that I would succeed so long as I was allowed to be tough and to act fast. The Premier gave his endorsement right away. Soon after, my plan was approved formally and I was able to be begin implementation. It was one of the most difficult periods of my life. Night and day, all I could think about was transforming the banking sector. I knew we had to seize the moment, all available opportunities, and introduce major reforms decisively and quickly. We restructured almost all the banks, big and small, it required a combination of a broader vision, a building block approach, and a scientific sequence. We also decided from day one, very early on, to disclose to the whole world the real picture, all the real figures about our bank's operations. The lesson we had already learned, sometimes painfully, and where we are heading. This transparency was crucial in building trust at home and the credibility overseas. Further, we were very specific about the pace at which we were planning to turn the banks around. Honesty simplifies almost all problems. Through transparency, the market was able to grasp my ideas and understand my determination to break our old habits. I had also done a lot to cultivate awareness within CBRC and among other stakeholders about the need for reform. People started to acknowledge the importance and urgency of my and also their tasks. And the results soon spoke loudly for themselves. 41 foreign strategic institutional investors joined 32 Chinese banks, ranging from the top five to a very tiny small bank situated in the remote areas in Sichuan province. And nine foreign banks invested in 41 township small financial institutions. More important, bad assets were hived off, new capital was injected, and the new skills and the knowledge and experience poured in. As we skirt the iceberg and sailed on, opinions about Chinese banking sector began to change. Today, all four big state banks and 10 medium-sized mixed ownership banks are listed at home and abroad, with price book ratio at over three times. The revenue have increased by 15 to 25 percent annually. Meanwhile, the cash pool set aside for bridging the gap between the book value and the bid value of bad assets carved out at the start of the reforms continued to fill until it brimmed over. In other words, Chinese taxpayers did not have to pay a penny to turn around our banking industry, something in which my colleagues and I take a great personal pride. The transformation was so fast that every day counted. When the lost the big state bank which is Agricultural Bank of China, was floated on the Hong Kong and the Shanghai stock markets 
in June year 2008, it had a price book ratio well above three times. Luck was on our side with the timing. As you all know, three months later, Lehman Brothers went bust. The average price book ratio dropped sharply and has still not returned to its original level. But all in all, it has been a good deal, both in terms of financial returns and pushing rapidly through China's banking reform. This is a vivid picture reflecting, as saying goes, time and the tide wait for no man. Why I'm gratified that the overall outcomes of these efforts has been positive, I must honestly admit the reforming Chinese banking sector was not easy job. There were no shortcuts. CBRC had to start by transforming itself. This meant studying international best practices in particular, focusing on how to assess risks when operating under existing global rules and environments. We knew that talent was critical to capacity building and would provide a foundation for transforming the whole sector. So we formed the World Class International Advisory Council from the first year, benefiting from the wisdom of Sir Eddie George, Sir Howard Davis, Jerry Corrigan, Hami Karuana, Andrew Sen, and many others. We also worked closely with the Hong Kong Monetary Authority to place experts from Hong Kong into our structure to help us introduce new technology, information technology system, build our data system, and deal with the many complexities of the reform process. Each year I recruit, each year I recruited talent employees from our board and sent at least the five others overseas to pursue their MBAs. With the innovative ideas and the practical knowledge they brought to CBRC, we soon had terms of capable supervisors on standby to fix difficult banks. It is worth remembering that when China's reform and opening started in the late 1970s, per capita income was only $182, and the trade accounted only for 11.2% of GDP. Last year, per capita income stood at 5,414 US dollar and the trade accounted for 65% of our GDP. This spectacular success is the fruit of the dedication and hard work of two generations in running. For many, it was a long, hard road. In my own case, after leaving home in my teens, I tilled the land, I worked in the factory, and for more than 20 years experienced nothing but a rejection as I tried to serve my people better, but I never gave up. Last October, I delivered my final quarterly briefing on current economic and financial conditions to all my regulated bodies. Such sharing information and views had become a regular practice during my eight years at CBRC. Soon after, less than one month, I had left the CBRC for good. And before Christmas, I was attending a concert when a senior executive from a big Chinese bank came over during the interval. He said, I just want to thank you for all the forecasts and warnings you gave in your quarterly briefings. He said, we admire you for this. 
Before I could respond, he had gone. We admire you for this. At that moment, I no longer felt like captain of Titanic. <laughs> so while my last job was still at least a thankful one, just to be part of a, such an endeavor was a reward enough. And unlike poor Captain Smith, I'm lucky that I have lived to tell you the tale. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I have really enjoyed very much my retired life now by thinking big thoughts but relish in some small pressures. But wherever I go, my love for China and my commitment